It's my genuine pleasure to introduce Professor Durham. Um, Meenakshi Gigi Durham is a distinguished scholar, teacher, and writer whose work centers on media and the politics of the body. Her research emphasizes issues of gender, sexuality, race, youth cultures, and sexual violence. She holds a joint appointment in journalism and mass communication and was associate dean for outreach and engagement for the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences from 2017 to 2019. Uh, I encourage you all to visit her faculty uh, bio page here. Uh, it's nothing but laurels on laurels, but more than that, it's pretty cool and interesting. So anyway, um, please take it away. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, and thank you all uh, for inviting me here today. I love librarians and I want to give um, a special shout out to Donald Baxter and Tim Arnold. I don't think they're here today, but they helped me so much with my, with my research, especially for this book. They're actually in the acknowledgements of this book. Um, so as many of you know, my research, and as Lisa just said, um, is on genders and sexualities in the media and often about sexual violence in the media addressed from an intersectional feminist perspective. And this theme is taken up in my last book, which came out last April from Polity Press, Me Too, The Impact of Race, uh, Rape Culture in the Media. And I'm just gonna share my screen now and pop my slides up um, and hopefully that will work. Um, Zoom is always a little challenging, um, but you know, I'll do my best to advance slides and talk to you. And you can let me know if the slides are not advancing or something like that. I've, I've sort of changed the screen so I can't see you. So if somebody will just put in the chat or yell, shout out or something, if something isn't working, just let me know, okay? Um, so, uh, so you'd think that there would have been like more than enough discussion of the Me Too movement, you know, by now and its global ramifications and so on. But what the media have been referring to as a quote, Me Too moment has extended for decades now. And it shows no slant signs of slowing down, which is why I turned to the topic. The issues are ongoing, the complexities of the movement are only now being brought to light, and the imperative of anti-rape and anti-sexual misconduct activism remains great. Um, of course, we all know that the Black feminist scholar, um, uh, oh gosh, I'm trying to see if my slides will advance and they're not doing it, so let me see if I can, ah, here we go. Um, so we all know that the Black feminist activist Tarana Burke really started the movement using the phrase me too, in connection with her work with young girls of color who had experienced sexual abuse and assault. I'll return to Ms. Burke's work during this talk, but she should absolutely be recognized as the founder of this movement um, and of grassroots work to support survivors and create solidarity through speaking this, the truth of what happened to them and seeking healing from it. The hashtag, which is the tweet sent out by the actor Alyssa Milano in 2017, as revelations of sexual assault in the Hollywood film industry were emerging, um, it turned the phrase me too, I'm gonna turn this off so you can see better. Um, it turned the, the phrase me too um, into a viral phenomenon and a globally recognized catchphrase that referred to the prevalence of sexual abuses in workplaces. Um, as well as in every space we can possibly imagine, right? The Catholic church, other religious organizations, schools, universities, hospitals, sports, the Boy Scouts, in homes, the ubiquity of sexual predation is stunning and sickening. Um, of course, there were hashtags about sexual violence that predated Me Too, hashtag Me Too, and anti-rape activism has a long history. So, um, you know, so we, I think we really need to think about the, about that fact. Um, um, you know, the in the U.S. and globally, many movements were already underway that address this issue. Um, I'm thinking about hashtags like hashtag Yes All Women, hashtag Been Raped Never Reported, and movements like Take Back the Night, which began as long ago as 1977. Many of you will remember that. Um, the protests following the notorious New Delhi bus rape and murder happened in 2012. Uh, the worldwide women's marches of early 2017. You know, so to imagine that activism against sexual violence began with a tweet five years ago is highly inaccurate. Though I think that may be the impression that people have now. However, that hashtag, hashtag me too, had an unprecedented impact. It generated more than 2.3 million tweets from 85 countries in its first week more than any other. 
Tarana Burke has described that tweet as a quote, lightning bolt that gave life to the movement she had started. And the term has caught on. We all know at some basic level what Me Too refers to, the speaking out about sexual misconduct by survivors. But there's also a lot of confusion about the goals of that acknowledgement, about the public nature of the revelations of sexual abuse and assault, and about the implications and impact of survivors' testimony. Um, so I'll try to address these issues you know, today as well. I think the elephant in the living room, so to speak, um, to me, was the fact that the media have been a key factor in this movement, and not just because so much attention has been given to social media as a venue for feminist resistance to sexual violence. That's really important, of course. But in reflecting on Me Too and its entailments, it struck me that the media workplace was the site of decades of sexual misconduct that were first addressed through the hashtag. It was through the revelations of decades of sexual assault and harassment at media companies uh, such as Fox News, the Weinstein Company, NBC, CBS, BBC, CBC in Canada, um, that we began to get a sense for how rape culture was entrenched in the practices and processes in these workplaces, how sexual violence was systemic, to use a word that we're hearing a lot, you know, more and more now. Uh, scrutinizing the media corporations where rape culture ran rampant, yet was deliberately concealed from view, provides insight into the institutional framework for sexual predation at work. And to say this is not to blithely presume that the way things happened at wealthy major media corporations can be mapped directly onto, say, a meatpacking plant in Iowa or a casino in Macau, even though those workplaces are just as likely to abet sexual violence. But plainly, that's too easy a leap. However, there's also evidence, given the rise of the hashtag MeToo and MeToo movements globally, that the sexual predation exposed in Hollywood and New York bridged to systems and structures of workplaces in the US and around the world. Sandra Pazqueda, a working class Latino woman, observed in Time magazine, and I'll just show you her quote here. Um, someone, I'm just gonna see if I can, okay, wait, um, sorry, that's us, okay. Um, Here's the quote. Someone who is in the limelight is able to speak out more easily than people who are poor. The reality of being a woman is the same. The difference is the risk that each woman must take. Those differential risks are of course significant. The life consequences, financial, familial, physical, are much greater and potentially more calamitous for poor women, women of color, lesbian women, trans women, so, you know, there, we do have to think about that. However, like the media workplace as the literal site of hashtag Me Too and the discursive site of resistance via the hashtag bracket the role of the media in reporting on and representing sexual violence in its messages. These representations run the gamut from the reporting of, for example, the Boston Globe's spotlight team that revealed the pedophilia and sexual abuse within, you know, the Catholic Church, um, and that's the real spotlight team, not the not the movie, not the not the actors. Um, uh, so, and they they raised awareness of the issue, and you know, and they affected some attempts at redress, though I think not nearly enough yet. Um, to popular culture like Game of Thrones, to Robin Thicke's infamous Blurred Lines music video, to online revenge porn and cyber stalking. So, taking all of this into account, uh, my book focuses on the media you know, as a, as a linchpin, as I say, of sexual violence. Um, and it's also divided into three sections. Um, rapacity, the first one, which takes a close look at the media workplaces in which women like the news anchor Megan Kelly and the actor Rose McGowan were assaulted and the dynamics that both fostered a rape culture and kept it secret for decades. Representation, which examines both reporting on sexual violence and other forms of media representation and their links to rape culture, as well as some of the erasures in representation and resistance, which examines both the critiques of and resistance to Me Too, as well as the movement as a form of resistance to rape culture. So that's kind of double-edged. Um, for the theorists among us, this organizational structure follows a classical cultural studies model first developed by Richard Johnson of the Birmingham Center. Um, so I'm examining here the conditions of production of the media, the media messages, and the media audience's response to these events. 
because we live in a media saturated environment. It's easy to dismiss the media as background noise or you know, just entertainment or insignificant in some way, but really we are immersed in the media. Um, just give me a second here because I'm going to look at my notes. Um, they're part of our lives. We're all on screens. We're engaged in social media. We were tuned into the news, into popular culture. And it's ingenuous to pretend that this 24 seven engagement doesn't affect us at all, even though we'd like to believe that we're impervious to it. Um, as the media scholar Douglas Keldner has written, radio, television, film, and the other products of media culture, and I'm gonna put this quote up on my screen, um, provide materials out of which we forge our very identities, our sense of selfhood, our notion of what it means to be male or female, our sense of class, of ethnicity and race, of nationality, of sexuality, and of us and them. Media images help shape our view of the world and our deepest values. Media stories provide the symbols, myths, and resources through which we constitute a common culture and through the appropriation of which we insert ourselves into this culture. We're immersed from cradle to grave in a media and consumer society. Rape culture in the media is no different. The media's deep imbrication with rape culture must be taken seriously in order to understand the systemic nature of sexual violence and the possibilities for uh, challenging it. I argue in the book that the media environment is a complex one that both asserts and sustains rape culture as well as providing spaces for resistance and change. I'm hopeful that resistance will win out. Let me speak first though about the first section of the book entitled Rapacity. Um, here, I look at the men, and it has been primarily men uh, who are the perpetrators of workplace sexual assault in the media industries and how their crimes were endorsed by the workplace culture. The men who were first revealed to have committed these crimes were men that many of us had grown up admiring and liking and trusting. You know, for example, Bill Cosby, Matt Lauer, who many of us had grown, you know, begun our mornings with. Uh, Harvey Weinstein, who produced, among other great films, Good Will Hunting, Shakespeare in Love, The English Patient, the Fox News host, Bill O'Reilly. I wasn't a fan, but millions of people truly trusted him. The hip hop star, R. Kelly, the list goes on. Um, and I'm just gonna pop up a few more here. Uh, you know, Even as these revelations were unfurling, media men in various nations and regions were also being identified as sexual predators, like the BBC's Jimmy Seville, who's you know, in this picture, the Canadian uh, radio host, Gian Gomeshi, the Indian Bollywood star, Nada Patekar, Japanese television reporter, Noriyuki Yamagachi, and Mexican television director, Gustavo Loza, to name just a few. We discovered because of the hashtag MeToo movement that these men had engaged in serious sexual violence regularly, targeting multiple women over long periods of time. And nothing of this was ever revealed until these stories broke just a few years ago and lawsuits were finally filed. It would be easy to dismiss these sexual assaults as individual aberrations, isolated acts to be chalked up to personality problems. Yet the frequency and scope of the behaviors call for a different level of analysis. The very similarity of the patterns of, you know, of the assaults reported via hashtag MeToo um, speaks to the existence of a systemic framework um, that gives rise, gave rise to and sustained these crimes. In my book, I look at why these media workplaces were petri dishes for rape culture to flourish. Move forward here. So yeah, why? Why were the media industries like so important in, um, you know, in this in, in this series or this systemic culture of sexual violence? And my you know, first, I think, is the gender power imbalance, which is replicated in many industries. So in these media corporations, men held the highest positions and earned astronomically high salaries, and they brought in millions of dollars for the companies. And that is really something important uh, that's, you know, that explains some of this behavior. Um, in the creative industries of which film and television are an important sector, um, there's, you know, they are marked by an unequal distribution of power in which a small number of power, small number of people hold an inordinate amount of power and men rank high, occupying most of the executive and decision-making positions. One analysis of news companies covering 59 nations and 522 organizations found that men hold 75% of the top executive and board positions. <clears throat> uh, in addition, this, the annual celluloid ceiling report 
which tracks women's employment in film and television, found that women comprise only 20% of all directors, writers, producers, editors, and cinematographers working on the top 250 grossing films worldwide. This has implications as men in powerful positions have used their power to victimize women. This is not to say that all men do this, nor that all men are sexual assailants, but the workplace power imbalance works for those who are inclined that way. I compare this in the book to the medieval droit de seigneur, um, the right of noblemen to have sex with women of lower status. The women who are, the, I mean, rather the men who were the rapists in these industries felt entitled and their entitlement was not only economic and legal, but sexual. One quote that I feel is a telling indicator of this sense of sexual entitlement is the way a prosecutor described Har Harvey Weinstein's worldview. Um, she said, women, quote, want to be in this universe and the universe is run by me and they don't get to complain when they're stepped on or demoralized or raped and abused. And just this past Monday, actually, on the NPR show Fresh Air, talking about Bill Cosby, the writer-director W. Kamau Bell said that in Hollywood, the star gets what the star wants, adding that, Cosby existed in what he called an ecosystem of sexual misconduct, where powerful men felt entitled to sexual access to women. In addition, men with traditional views of masculinity tend to be more aggressive toward women. The media industries are predicated in many ways on stereotypical sex roles, especially as on-camera women were required in many of these workplaces to be sexualized as part of their jobs. At Fox News, for example, women were pressured to wear heavy beauty pageant makeup, short skirts, high heels, and body hugging clothing. Men weren't. CEO Roger Ailes had, reported, had a reported obsession with women's legs, arranging studio sets so that a leg cam blatantly focused on news anchors' legs, female news anchors' legs. Needless to say, there were no such requirements for men. It was a similar situation for the women actors who were assaulted by Weinstein. They were told later that their sexual assault claims ha would have no validity because they had presented themselves sexually in films or on magazine covers or in advertisements. Hmm. So I'm in no way suggesting that the women's dress or behavior justified assault. I'm only pointing out that it was both required by the companies as a condition of work, unlike the men, and it was used by the men and by the corporations as a justification for their assaults and a reason for silencing their complaints. I wanna speak next about silencing as there were mechanisms built into these work environments that were specifically set up to silence sexual assault survivors. Looking at these mechanisms illustrates the systemic nature of sexual violence in the workplace. Um, for example, many of these corporations had no safe place where women could report these crimes. The women were terrified of losing their jobs and the HR departments were often set up so that their reports were not confidential. In fact, employees of the Weinstein com company described the human resources office as a sham, a place where complaints went to die. Reports made there were not confidential. Weinstein was informed about all of them. In other workplaces like the CBC, the HR personnel told the women to just quote unquote, work around the issue, or they were informed that the situations were not the corporation's responsibility which was the case with R. Kelly. The, the record labels executives were fully aware of his uh, of the sexual assault allegations, um, especially with minor women. And they just basically said, not our problem. Um, in some of these cases, the women's reputations were smeared and their careers were destroyed when they spoke out. After the actor and model Ambra Gutierrez filed, filed a police report against Harvey Weinstein for sexually molesting her, Tabloid newspapers began publishing lurid accounts about her having worked as a prostitute in Italy. The stories, which Gutierrez maintains are false, appear to have been sourced by an intelligence firm hired by Weinstein. Some of the Fox News complainants were subjected to rumors that they were alcoholics or drug addicts or otherwise unfit to work, and many of them lost their careers forever. Yet another strategy is referred to as catch and kill, where these media corporations also overtly silenced women through paying for the rights to their stories and then killing them or concealing them, never publishing them. But the women had lost the rights to tell the story. And finally, there's the use of NDAs or non-disclosure agreements, which to me are the worst tactic of all because they acknowledge the reality of the sexual assault, yet they pay the women for keeping it secret. Some of these women were disallowed by these legal agreements from telling anyone, even a therapist, about 
what they had suffered. And they, uh, they, you know, they suffered from post-rape trauma for years with no way to seek help even. Um, so I'm really pleased that Congress just passed a bill banning arbitration in sexual assault cases. And that was a bill pushed by Gretchen Carlson, the former Fox News anchor who was sexually assaulted by CEO Roger Ailes. So I'll just sort of click through some of these silencing mechanisms that were you know, entrenched in, in the way that these companies are, um, operate and the way that many companies operate. So in my book, I also discuss the way that sexual violence was endorsed by men in positions of political power, such as President Jair Bolsonaro of Brazil, former President Silvio Berlusconi, and our own former President Donald Trump, all of whom publicly referred to women in sexualized and predatory terms, even suggesting or supporting sexual assault. These men are influential and they normalize and naturalize not only this view of women, uh, but these behaviors. I'm thinking about Clarence Thomas and Brett Kavanaugh too. You know, none of this um, interfered with their rise to positions of immense power and influence, which should give us pause and remind us that the ways in which rape culture is, you know, is systemic and systematized, uh, you know, rises to the highest levels of, of power in our societies. Um, I'll move on now to the section of the book I call representation, as it looks at the media messages themselves. The first chapter in this section deals with the famous Time magazine cover, which many of you must have seen, where the Person of the Year award went to the silence breakers of the Me Too movement. It's well known now that in their choice of cover personalities, they omitted Tarana Burke, which is interesting. I mean, they left out the actual founder of the movement. I argue in the book that in erasing her from their tribute, they also erased multiple histories of anti-rape activism by women of color and other marginalized and overlooked people. I won't spend a lot of time on that, you know, given that we don't have that much time here, but there's a full analysis of this erasure in the book. I, I, you know, I gave it a whole chapter because it matters so much. So moving on, I think many of you are familiar with the fact that uh, some of the biggest Me Too cases broke in the media thanks to award-winning reporting. Um, as I mentioned, you know, by, for example, the Boston Globe Spotlight team, the Indianapolis Star's um, investigation of Larry Nasser and USA Gymnastics complicity, the Miami Herald's revelations of Jeffrey Epstein's rape and sex trafficking of young girls, the New York Times and the New Yorker's coverage of Harvey Weinstein, these were examples of the media's key role in exposing and drawing worldwide attention to the way these crimes were, again, occurring routinely with active organizational collusion and cover-ups. As a journalism professor and a media scholar, I have to say that this reporting was courageous, thorough, and sensitive. Um, actually, I'm going to stop sharing for a minute because I want to sh um, show you a clip um, that's from, uh, you know, that that uh, from the Indie Star reporter. Um, Maria Witkowski's, uh, an interview with her about the, um, um, about the way that they investigated the Larry Nasser case. And let me see if I can pull that up and make it run. I'm just gonna turn off my sound for a second and see if I can get this to... Oftentimes there is such a profound shame uh, that survivors of abuse carry around with them. How difficult was it for you to get these survivors to speak on the record about their experiences? Mark, Alicia, Tim Evans and I, my colleagues and I, we spent a lot of time working with the survivors and talking to them about what we were working on, why we wanted to share their stories, and how we were gonna use the information that we received. And we continued to keep them involved in the process, letting them know when the story about their experience might be coming out 
to really make them comfortable and feel that they had the control over their own story and their own experiences. And I think that for us, that really helped give them a level of comfort to share what they had gone through. As you were going through this investigation, Marissa, at what point in your reporting did you fully begin to realize the scope of the abuse that had taken place within USA Gymnastics? So we knew pretty early on that USA Gymnastics executives had had for years a policy of not reporting all allegations to police and that that policy could put children at risk with coaches who might move from gym to gym despite warning signs. And so we knew from the beginning what that policy was, and we spent the next few months looking into how often that policy had come into play. And we found a number of examples in that early reporting, but nothing of the scope of what we found with Larry Nasser. You're still muted. Sorry, yeah, I, I'm sorry. I'm just going to stop that there um, and then get back to my slides. But um, but I think it's it's clear that the journalists thought really hard about the impact of telling their stories publicly on the survivors. They involved the survivors in the story. They considered how to describe the assaults without being salacious or gratuitous. It was really good reporting. And it prompted some reflection on the part of the organizations. Though six years later, not enough has changed. That isn't the reporter's fault though, it's the intransigence of these institutions. They're not responding to the reporting and the revelations. Okay, let me see if I can get back to my slides here. Hang on. That's, this is the problem with, some, with Zoom, right? <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there was the, the there was the Indy Stars reporting. There was the Miami Herald's reporting about the uh, Jeffrey Epstein case. There was um, uh, the New York Times and the New Yorker's coverage of Harvey Weinstein and and you know that won Pulitzers. And so you know I think the reporting on these 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 stories in particular was was really excellent and really did help to raise consciousness about this issue. Um, and still, you know, I think reporting on sexual violence could be better. One of the things we know is that some survivors and victims, I will use that term too, as not everyone survives. And the word victim to me recenters the fact that there was a perpetrator. Some survivors and victims are more credible than others. Race, class, sexual orientation, gender identity of the victim and the perpetrator matter in terms of whose accounts are believed, which cases are followed up by police, by police which are prosecuted, what the outcomes are and so on. Brown and black women, trans women, people with disabilities, people in poverty are less credible rape victims and survivors than straight white women, whose cases are the most likely to be reported, to be believed and to be uh, prosecuted legally. And statistically, most rape reports are real. Studies show that worldwide fewer than 8% are unfounded. Um, so, and, and you know, in addition, in general, sexual, most sexual violence is unreported because of the shame, the blame, the vilification experienced by rape victims. Um, so there's no, you know, there's no real reason to consider that some women's or people's reports uh, are not, you know, are not credible, um, but that's what happens. The media too underreports crimes against women of color, trans people, non-binary people, LGBTQ, LGBTQIA people, people with disabilities and so on. And in the coverage, these victims and survivors tend to be blamed for the assault, the crimes are treated as if it was just bad sex rather than violence, and the stories are quickly forgotten. The recent case of Gabby Petito, the young woman who went missing on a road trip and was later found murdered in Wyoming, prompted much discussion of the missing white woman syndrome, which was a, a term that was coined by P PBS anchor Gwen Ifill. These women are not missing from the media. And I'm not arguing that they should be, as we need to be constantly aware of how common violence against all women is. But women of color and victims of other genders um, are missing, and that needs to be changed. Reporters need to take seriously their responsibility to cover these situations inclusively, equitably, and in line with the best practices that have been developed by experts in the field, which include things like not naming rape survivors, not focusing on the lascivious details, not including the survivor's sexual history, and so on. Um, there are actually good guidelines in place and that they're not followed enough. Um, 
So representation also includes cyber stalking and other forms of online violence, which are commonly used to persecute, harass, and shame women. These forms of violence include posting nude pictures of women without their consent, revenge porn, and doxing, to name just a few. There are very few laws that protect people against this form of sexual violence. Victims are usually told to go offline as if it was their fault. Many of them have had to quit their jobs, move, or go into hiding. Some have committed suicide. Some have been tracked down by their harassers and attacked or murdered. So women are forming alliances online, but clear legal solutions are still not in place. These online feminist communities, though, are a first step towards consciousness raising, you know, and legal and policy changes. So I'm hopeful that at least it's a start. So I'll move um, finally to the last section of my book, uh, which is called Resistance. I see this concept as a double-edged sword, as I mentioned earlier. On the one hand, Me Too is seen as a movement of feminist resistance to sexual assault, abuse, harassment, and other forms of sexual violence. I read it this way too. Me Too is a mo movement against sexual abuse and assault, a movement to speak out about and stop rape, broadly defined. But there's also been resistance to Me Too, charges of it being a witch hunt, a way to take men down, an oversensitive misinterpretation of friendly compliments or you know, joshing. So <clears throat> I wanna say categorically that it is not. Survivors of sexual violence know the difference between a well-intentioned compliment and harassment. They know the difference between a platonic hug and unwanted fondling or an actual assault. We aren't stupid. If there are occasional misunderstandings or overreactions, I can only say that that happens in every sphere where misconduct is investigated. No system is perfect, but the goals of this one are to end rape and sexual abuse not to, you know, end mutually consensual, you know, or prevent, you know, flirtations or romances from blossoming. So here, I actually want to talk briefly about the issue of consent, which I spend some time on in my book. I find this to be a very interesting and salient issue regarding the reporting and investigation of sexual violence, as survivors, especially women, are questioned over and over about their possible consent to the assault. I find this to be very, you know, this is, I mean, this is really worth thinking about because, um, you know, many feminist scholars have noted that sexual assault is the only crime about which survivors consent is even an issue. There's never any question about whether a person consented to a robbery or a murder or even to having their phone hacked. But somehow rape is constantly viewed as somehow, you know, something to which the survivor or victim may have consented. Survivors' reports are constantly discredited by you know, accusations of consent, which is a form of victim blaming and shaming. You asked for it is the message. No one ever says you asked for it when you're robbed. There are other issues about the consent, you know, the, the concept of consent, which is the power relationship implied in the term. Who is consenting to whom? That concept assumes that there is an initiator and a recipient, one of whom is in the passive role of saying yes or no to the other. In that sense, consent is not equitable. Sometimes women and others may appear to consent because they're afraid or because they don't think they have an option or because it is a social expectation that after a man has paid for dinner, he's entitled to sex. These circumstances are not actual affirmation of welcome sex as the feminist legal scholar, Catherine McKinnon refers to it. So some feminists are turning to the, um, you know, turning to the term assent instead, as it offers more mutuality, more agency on the uh, part of both or all actors, clear affirmation that the situation is wanted, as opposed to silence or passive capitulation being interpreted as consent. So in an early version of the book, I use this quote from the 18th century legal scholar, William Blackpone, uh, Blackstone, who wrote in his commentaries on the laws of England, if it was possible that she might have been heard and she made no outcry, these and the like circumstances carry a strong but not conclusive presumption that her testimony is false or feigned. But there are so many reasons a woman or another you know, victim survivor may not cry out or struggle, fear of further violence or of being killed, shock, lack of knowledge about what to do, shame, and none of these are the same as assent or even consent. So 
again, there's so much to say about all of this, but you know, given the time, uh, I think I, I should probably move on to um, you know, conclusions that I've come to after reflecting on the Me Too movement and its entailments. So following Foucault, I see sexual violence as an apparatus. In Foucault's conceptualization, an apparatus is a social mechanism that has a dominant social function. Rape and other forms of sexual violence have a strategic function, and they're, they're used to dominate and terrorize certain categories of people, especially women, to exploit their socially imposed vulnerability in order to consolidate their subordinate status, and at the same time to reassert the power of others, too often male. So to consider sexual violence as a social apparatus is to recognize the way it has figured into histories of colonization, slavery, genocide, racism, homophobia, transphobia, and gender-based oppression. It's not just about a chance encounter between a victim and an, assailment, an assailant. It's an enactment at the individual level of historically rooted social beliefs and structures that recode sex as violence and dehumanize people through sexual victimization. This recoding changes sex. It changes something that has the potential to be ethical as well as you know, playful, pleasurable, intimate, loving into an atrocity. And as with genocide, the resulting trauma is to society as well as to the individual you know, victim slash survivor. In the apparatus of sexual violence, the media are central mechanisms, as I've maintained throughout. They report on incidents of sexual violence, on reactions to them, on the statements made by various stakeholders. They are the, the cradle of commentaries, crossfire, rhetorical salvos, hashtags. They're the site of representations of sexual violence, both fictive uh, you know, and non-fictional. They have been the site of silencing and discounting rape in its survivor victims but they've also been the site of silence breaking. So there are you know, frictions involved in all of this, but frictions create sparks. These mediated altercations are provoking intensive reflection as well as action. Feminists and anti-violence activists have seen great potential in the global take up of Me Too, but there are many things to think about as well. The movement has been criticized for its centering of privileged white women. And there's something that's true. There's something that really matters in terms of the emphasis on you know, public disclosure of one's experience of sexual violence, the blowback and the penalties for speaking out that accrue to people in positions of less social power and greater vulnerability are much harsher and more dangerous than for wealthy celebrities or for other privileged people. So how can we create a world where it's safe for everyone to report, you know, where they, they, you know, they're not penalized for telling these stories? In addition, the Me Too movement is too tied to car carceral justice in many people's views. And this is especially problematic given the high rates of rape in prison. How can it be a feminist remedy to consign rapists to institutions where they are at grave risk of rape themselves, queries the legal scholar Constance Backhouse. If we're against rape, we are against all rape. I'm becoming more and more interested in reparative and restorative justice. I think we can learn from indigenous communities in which the survivor and the community were involved in the re rehabilitation or punishment of the perpetrator. What alternative pathways can we find besides criminal courts to end rape? Another issue I want to address is the importance of cross-gender, cross-border alliances in the struggle to stop sexual violence. Straight men especially are important allies in this struggle. Finally, some thoughts about vulnerability, which is the focus of my current book project. Vulnerability has traditionally been seen as weakness, passivity, something to be denied and overcome. I've heard of sexual violence survivors who refused to admit that they had been harmed by their assaults because they saw that very admission as shameful or an admission of the perpetrator's power over them, which they don't want to give away. And I understand that, but I want to rethink vulnerability. I want to see it not as shameful or a terrible thing, but as a catalyst for examining the structural causes of vulnerability in order to change them 
And this extends beyond sexual vulnerability to environmental and racial and national and resource related vulnerabilities. Why are we differentially vulnerable? And I think we have to admit that we're all vulnerable. We're all going to be vulnerable at some point in our lives, too. You know, we were vulnerable as babies. As we age, we're going to be more and more vulnerable because our bodies grow frailer. Um, you know, all of us are always vulnerable to all sorts of circumstances, you know, climate change, um, you know, matters of the heart, like pain. So we need to both, you know, recognize that we're all vulnerable and then look at the differences in our vulnerabilities that often accrue to things like, you know, many of us are more vulnerable, for example, to sexual assault, um, to, to poverty, to starvation, to displacement, things like that. Um, and we need to be thinking about what creates those conditions of vulnerability. How can we acknowledge vulnerability and alleviate the abuses of vulnerability so that we're all free to live our lives, to flourish, to be vulnerable, and to honor that in ways that keep us safe from harm? So I guess I'll end my talk today with that vision. Um, and at this point, I, you know, again, thank you for giving me this time. And I would be really happy to, you know, discuss any of this with you or to hear your questions, your comments, your thoughts. So thanks again.